Newman again is the hustler now. 25 years later, he spots young Tom Cruise as raw talent he can train to fool suckers. The name of the film, The Color of Money. The Color of Money is one of four new movies we're going to be reviewing this week, along with our regular segment reviewing a couple of new releases in video cassette stores. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, although it might sound like a sequel to The Hustler, The Color of Money is actually more like another chapter in the continuing story of Fast Eddie Felson's obsession with the game of pool. Felson is played again, of course, this time by Paul Newman, and years have passed since the last movie, and now he's a wise old pro who has learned all of his lessons the hard way. Then he discovers an incredibly talented kid played by Tom Cruise and decides to back him financially and coach him into the world of big-time pool hustling. She got a, an area of excellence. You're good at something. You're the best at something, anything. Then. Rich can be arranged. I mean, rich can come fairly easy. Really? Yeah. You got some other area of excellence beside this stalker? Nine balls? Right? There's some piece of work. I'm some piece of work. You're also a natural character. I've been telling her that. You know, I got a natural character. No, that's not what I said, kid. I said you are a natural character. You're an incredible flake. Later in the film, their partnership breaks up, and Newman and Cruz are competitors in a national pool tournament. distracting for me there, the way all of those pool balls bounced around like that, and the scene gets even worse as it goes on. That's not pool, that's gimmickry. It looked like it was set up for a TV commercial or something. And it's all the more disappointing because The Color of Money was directed by Martin Scorsese, who is one of the two or three best movie directors around today, and it revisits some of the hard-boiled pool halls that he also explored in his great 1973 movie, Mean Streets. But this film is a disappointment. It doesn't have the interior energy, and the drive and the obsession of most of the best Scorsese films, films like Raging Bull and Taxi Driver, and a lot of the time it's just a standard, sort of predictable narrative. The performances in the movie seem strong enough in and of themselves, but somehow they never really connect. You never, you get the idea of the relationships, but you never really feel the passion. And there's one more big problem. The movie leads us right up to the brink of a big payoff, a final showdown between Newman and Cruz, and then it doesn't deliver. Now, sure, I know, they probably thought it was irrelevant who would win the final big game between the old man and the kid. Well, that's a great theory, but in practice, I felt cheated. I didn't like the ending either, and the last shot of the movie I really didn't like, but I, I want to get into the other reason why I didn't like the movie, and I was shocked because he's one of my favorite directors, too. Mm -hmm. I think it's the script here. I don't think that I've seen a movie by such a great director where I've been able to predict what's going to happen. At first, the kid is just a pure player, and he's sort of a rock and roller, almost like the character he played in Top Gun, a hot shot, and he's gonna be, have to be trained by the, the wise old guy. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Then he's going to go along, and then they're going to break up and pull apart, and then they're going to square so, off. So, this far, movie, we've got the Karate Kid, the, right? The, the design of this movie, the overall design, mm -hmm. is just known right from the beginning, and there wasn't anything that surprised me. Now, the characters are, 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 are fine, but the script isn't good. It's the old man and the young kid, and linear, linear, just yeah. as we've seen it in so many other movies. You expect with Scorsese more character things, more twists, not just that the point is to tell the story. That's right. not what you expect. That's and what's right. interesting in the movie are the corners. For example, Helen Shaver as Newman's girlfriend. Terrific, terrific role. Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio as Cruz's girlfriend. Yeah. They're interesting. They're giving some personality things. But the two main actors seem to be locked in this plot. Yes, I wish there had been more with the women and less of the obvious pool fights and the way it's all going to turn out. That's a big disappointment. Our next film is better, I think. It's called Sid and Nancy, and it's a dramatization of the life and death of two notorious figures in recent rock music. Sid Vicious, the guitarist of the early punk rock group The Sex Pistols, and Nancy Spungen, Sid's girlfriend. He was arrested for and charged with stabbing her to death, accidentally it seems, according to the movie. They were both drug addicts, though. Ultimately, that's what killed both of them in the late 1970s. But for a while, Sid did make some arresting, angry music, including my favorite musical scene in this movie, Sid Vicious' punk version of the Sammy Davis Frank Sinatra standard my way, and let's put it this way, <laughs> Sid's way is a different way. That's hilarious and entertaining. After performing, though, Sid Vicious and Nancy Spungen, the groupie who became his lover, invariably took drugs, which led to depression and talk about suicide. How should we do it? I can't jump off a building. Throw ourselves under a subway. OD. I think when a lot of people see this film, maybe older viewers, they may wonder why I make a film about a couple of self-destructive and sometimes deliberately offensive young people. And for a while, I held that question in my mind. But the film won me over because of the unblinking way it portrays the one-way track that is drug addiction. Drugs ruin everything. The music is gone. Their love is gone. They scream at the end. They vomit at the end much more than they make either love or music. Gary Oldman is perfect in his performance as Sid Vicious, and Chloe Webb does just as well with a less attractive character, if you think about it, Nancy Spungen. Sid and Nancy is a very good film, revealing the seductive power of rock music and of drugs. The former, rock music, an expression of freedom. The latter, drugs enslaving its users. It's a powerful film that really grows on you. It's a, it's a powerful film. It's a great film. It was directed by Alex Cox, the same man who made Repo Man. And mm -hmm. on the basis of these two films, his mm -hmm. first two films, this is a guy to keep your eye on. This mm -hmm. movie is so strong from beginning to end. And you know, of all of the scenes where every note seemed to be just right, the one I think is my favorite is when Nancy brings Sid home to meet her grandparents in that basement recreational room mm -hmm. in Connecticut. And you see there the tension that's almost palpable in the air not between the rude behavior of these two young people and the middle class values of the parents and grandparents, but the sadness, because they realize that these people are lost. And the sadness on the part of Nancy in particular, because she realizes that she's lost. And Sid says, why, uh, why didn't uh, they invite you back sooner? And she has a line something like, they know me. That's a great scene. Well, I think that I, I just think just this whole stuff in their room alone together, mm -hmm. when we see that this film is not romancing drugs, uh, it is not showing the injection of the needles. He's very clever about what he does. He holds that back, but he shows the effect. Yeah. He shows the effect, and that, to me, is very special. And then, at the same time, the high-driving energy of the Sex Pistols themselves. For a moment there, they were really doing something, but Sid Vicious just spun off into self-destruction. Next at the movies, Slick three misfits on the you loose in the swamps of Louisiana. Uh, you betcha. All you holiday travelers, beware. Looks like we got about a four-car pileup out there on the airline highway. 
Down by Law, and it's the new movie by Jim Jarmusch, who made last year's really wonderful film, Stranger Than Paradise. Now, that was about three misfits who drift from New York to Cleveland and then head to Florida for the dog races. This time, Jarmusch places his movie in Louisiana, where three totally incompatible characters find themselves sharing the same jail cell. One is a pimp, one is a has-been disc jockey, and the third is a completely bewildered Italian tourist. Excuse me, Jack. Zach. Zach. I have the accounts. Do you have some cigarette? No. 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 I understand. Thank you. Do you have a Zach some cigarette? I'm Jack. Get it straight. Yes, get it straight. But do you have some cigarette? Cigarettes won't help with hiccups, not in this country. <laughs> me, yes, uh, cigarette help me with uh, well, when I have day cups. What a likable goofball. The three <laughs> men escape from their cell and blunder through the bayou country until they stumble into a roadside cafe where the Italian falls in love with the owner. The other two guys are amazed. Look at their expressions. <laughs> There are some wonderful performances mm. in this movie. We almost need a roll call. If you can remember back to the first scene, the guy with the gravel voice is Tom Waits, the singer. The guy with the long face on the right in the second scene, that's John Lurie, who also starred in Stranger Than Paradise. The waitress is Nicoletta Brasci. She had some good wonderful. scenes. Wonderful. And the wacky Italian is some guy named Roberto Benini, and I don't know where he came from or if he'll ever work again, but his performance in this movie is absolutely original and very funny. In fact, he's probably the best reason to see the movie, which is kind of a meandering slice of life with some inspired moments, but also with a lot of other moments not so inspired. I guess I give the movie a marginal recommendation. A marginal recommendation is what I'd give it, too. Uh, there's an awful lot of time that the movie spends with them in jail before they break out, and I think too much time, because when they get to that roadside diner, which we saw in the second scene, that's when I thought the film really came alive with the unpredictability that really marks this Jim Jarmusch as a director. He spins his characters into situations r random, and he says, I don't care if it makes sense. Look at these people. Look at how they interact in strange situations. And when they are reacting all to him falling in love with this girl, yeah, that's he's astounded. That is the most beautiful, well, sweet I romance. Liked, I, I loved it. I liked a lot of stuff in the beginning of the movie better than you did, including the disc jockey and the whole business about his record collection. I just meant what the jail I stuff. also like looking again at uh, these scenes is the black and white. Sure. We talked about black and white versus color last week. Mm -hmm. This movie wouldn't have gained a thing in color. It's gritty. It's down to earth. Yeah. It needs to be in black and white. It feels right that way. I like it, too. Coming up next, a comedy about a schoolmaster obsessed uh, with time. His brain might as well be a clock. Know, um, is there anyone round here with a tractor? And it stars John Cleese, a member of the Monty Python comedy troupe, as an English schoolmaster obsessed with punctuality. That could be a funny premise for a movie. And the first few minutes of Clockwise are cute, as he is able to spot a tardy student from across the schoolyard. But as the film ticks along, Clockwise becomes a one-joke comedy, as a schoolmaster himself flirts with being late to a very important date. It's his keynote address to a convention of England's finest headmasters, and he's all excited about this big opportunity to speak. <laughs> But on the road with a couple of women in tow, he runs into all sorts of problems with his car that drives his punctual mind absolutely crazy. Now, I wanted to be in Norwich at 3 to greet everyone as they arrive. I can't be there at 3, so instead, I want to be there at 5 in time to deliver my speech. This is how mankind has evolved from the primeval slime by adapting to circumstances. We can't go forwards, so we'll go backwards instead. Put it in reverse for her, Laura. I'll push. Right? Right! Didn't you know, didn't you absolutely know in your heart of hearts he was going to get dirty? Didn't you know that mud was going to fly up and hit that shirt? Sure you knew it.
That's what's wrong with the movie. There are too many scenes like that. And the big payoff, his speech, is simply not funny either. The Monty Python gang specialized in short bits of humor, anywhere from a minute to ten minutes. And this might have been a good ten-minute film, a guy obsessed with time. But of all things, Clockwise is not very wise about its own running time. It runs on too long. I agree with you, Gene, and I was kind of amazed as I watched the movie to see all that effort going by, all of those locations. They go to a monastery, they go to a village uh, gas station, they're in and out of the countryside, they're losing their way on maps. Mm -hmm. Lots of energy that went into this movie, but the problem is, basically, I mean, now how else can I put this? It's not funny. Well, that's it's, a good way you know, to put it. And, I mean. and it's kind of, it kind of gets you after a while when you get payoff after payoff and you know, okay, this is my cue. This is where I'm supposed to laugh. And you think, I got the joke. I got it an hour ago okay. and it's just not funny. And the big payoff is his speech. I mean, yeah. I expected to be convulsed at that point. I wasn't laughing before then, but I expected, now that's got to be funny because his speech is going to be funny. He's going to really destroy the crowd or the crowd is going to destroy him. Nothing of the sort. Quite connect. Just You're falls right. flat. Disappointment. Too bad. When we come back, we'll review two new releases in the video stores. A cult classic about sideshow freaks and an overlooked Sean Penn movie. Your father's got kind of a rep. Well, yeah. Don't believe everything you hear. Now it's time for our weekly look at the new releases in your local video store. And the one I'm going to take down from the shelf this week is named At Close Range. It stars Sean Penn and Christopher Walken in two of the very best performances of 1986. That's right, this year, because although the movie was such a box office flop that it's in video only a few months after it hit the theaters, it's a great film. Walken plays a completely evil and cynical small-time gangster, and here's a scene where he's trying to impress his young sons. What are you thinking of? Looks like a pretty nice gun. It's 350 retail. I got a good price on mine. Real good. I thought you. Can I? Is that all right? <laughs> like it? I like it a lot. <laughs> you can't have it. It's mine. The final confrontation between Sean Penn and Christopher Walken in this movie is what movie acting is all about. Now, maybe the movie wasn't popular because it was a downer, but if you want to know why a lot of people think Sean Penn is a great actor, and so is Christopher would, Walken yeah. for that matter, then a close range is the answer. And if the movie were only about their two characters, I would have liked it too, but I thought that it got too much involved with uh, Christopher Walken's buddies and too much involved in a love story with Sean Penn. I think if it had just been more father and son confrontation, it would have been the good film that you described. Maybe that's what video was for. For somebody like you that doesn't quite like those parts, you can get it at home and not have to worry about sitting through the whole sure, movie. Sure, you just speed it along. I wouldn't okay. do that, though. I think it's a crime, but maybe you would. Okay, I'll commit that crime. Our next newly released home video cassette is an old film. In fact, I'm amazed it's just coming out in video cassette. It's Todd Browning's Freaks, a classic horror film from 1932, made two years after Browning directed the classic film Dracula. Freaks is even more eerie. It's set in the circus world, a world that has always held in my mind a dark side behind its clown face. The story involves one of the circus's big people, Cleopatra, a high wire walker, marrying one of the dwarves. She has a secret plot to kill him for his money. But at the wedding party, it's all smiles, with just the hint of danger. Hey, I'll make her one of us, a loving cop, a loving cop. We accept a one of us, we accept a one of us. Uba gobble, uba gobble. We accept her, we accept her. Uba gobble, uba gobble. One of us, one of us. Later, when the so-called freaks find out about her murder plan, they band together to murder Cleopatra and her boyfriend, Hercules. Now, this film is well known for the shot of the little people stalking the so-called normal people. But the lasting message of the movie is the way it reminds us to take no living thing for granted. Freaks is one very powerful movie. I would add it to my collection. Oh, I would, you know, it certainly is a powerful movie, and at the time that it came out, it was very controversial. Oh, yes. It didn't play in a lot of theaters. It was taken out of release, not so much because it offended the little people who got to be in this movie. The heroes. Uh, the, not only the heroes, but three-dimensional, complicated. Absolutely. But because it offended audiences who didn't want to know that there were people like that. And if right. you go to see this movie, or rent it for that matter, which is what we're recommending that you do, you're going to get a real powerful experience. This is one, though, I might buy, because I hmm. think I should have it. I'm 
surprised it hasn't been released before. Now let's take a little look at the movies we reviewed this week. We were both disappointed. Martin Scorsese's The Color of Money. There were some good performances, but the script is flat and predictable. Two thumbs up, though, for Sid and Nancy, a frightening and convincing portrait of the destructive power of drugs. We also liked Down by Law, the movie about three oddballs on the run. It had some rough edges, but some real charm, too. And finally, two thumbs down for Clockwise, a one-joke comedy, or even that one joke wasn't all that funny the first time. So, Sid and Nancy, the one we both agree on. And yeah. to me, this movie is just a little wonder. I don't know really where Alex Cox came from. His first movie, Repo mm -hmm. Man, was a miracle. And now, here comes another one, a really great film. It's very good. That's it for this week. Next time, we'll be back with the reviews of four more new movies, including Sigourney Weaver and Michael Caine in the spy drama, Half Moon Street, and James Earl Jones and C. Thomas Howell in Soul Man, a comedy about a young white man passing for black in order to win a Harvard Law School scholarship. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.